We're analyzing GSK to see if it's a great business on sale. We're using the Select 6 analysis to look at the most telling financial metrics before estimating an intrinsic value for GSK. Then we're giving a final rating to the business. There will be a key bonus metric along the way that just might be the tipping point when analyzing GSK for your stock portfolio. Before we get into these valuable metrics, let's understand GSK's stock performance. Right now, GSK trades for $35.15 per share. Year to date, their stock's pretty much flat. In the last five years, their stock price is down 32%. GSK spun off their consumer business, Halion, in July of 2022. The company's stock price had a big drop when they spun off Halion. It continued to fall after that and since then has rebounded slightly. It still owns a 13% stake in the business. With the two companies trading independently, both of them have their own multiples. In the last 10 years, their stock price is down 46.5%. Going back prior to the global financial crisis, their stock price is down 41% overall. Keep in mind this includes the decline in their stock price from their spinoff. And GSK is a big dividend payer. Right now, GSK pays a 3.88% dividend yield. Their average dividend yield throughout this time is in addition to their compounded annual returns. GSK trades $7 above their 52-week low. The company is down $20 from their 52-week high. GSK is a big business. They have a $71 billion market cap. But the burning question is, why should we be paying close attention to GSK? In the pharmaceutical industry, GSK, formerly known as GlaxoSmithKline, ranks as one of the largest companies by total sales. The company wields its might across several therapeutic classes, including respiratory, cancer, antiviral, as well as vaccines. GSK also uses joint ventures to gain additional scale in certain markets like HIV. GSK started the trend of these pharmaceutical businesses spinning off their consumer healthcare units, which Johnson & Johnson recently followed with their Kenview spinoff. Now that we have a background on the business, let's get into the numbers. Starting off with metric number one, we want their average return on capital in the last five years to be above 14%. The average publicly listed business earns about a 7% return on capital. Looking for a benchmark that's double this allows us to build in margin of safety based off the quality of the business. GSK's returns on capital have had their ups and downs over this time. They dropped to a low of 11.5% in both 2020 and 2021. Since their spinoff, they've increased these, however. In their last fiscal year, GSK earned 23% returns on capital. Averaged out over this time, they're earning about 17% returns on capital in a given year. This is a few percentage points above the benchmark we'd be looking for, meaning this is a check coming in on metric number one for GSK. Metric number two, we're looking for growth to back up these high returns on capital. We want to see five-year growth in their revenues, earnings, and free cash flows. This metric is all or nothing. All three of these have to be up for this to be a check. We'll also be including their numbers up until today. Due to their spinoff, this is going to be slightly skewed. Their revenues are down 8% when we include that spinoff. Their earnings are up massively. They've more than quadrupled as they had a $12 billion boost from discontinued operations. And because of the company's spinoff, when we include their numbers until today, their free cash flows are down 49%. They've almost been cut in half. While there's nuance here because of the business's breakup, this is still an X on metric number two. Metric number three, we're looking for earnings per share growth in the last five years. This looks at the company from the view of an individual shareholder in the business. We just learned the company had a huge boost in their earnings due to the discontinued operations from their spinoff. Even excluding that, their earnings are up over this time. GSK has diluted existing shareholders by about 3% as well, so slight shareholder dilution. However, their normal growth in their earnings is outpacing this, meaning this is going to be a check on metric number three. Their earnings per share are up over this time. Metric number four, we're looking for free cash flow per share growth in the last five years for GSK. A similar situation here, their free cash flows are down and they've diluted shareholders by 3%, meaning their free cash flows per share are down. This is an X on metric number four. Recapping where we stand currently, through four metrics were split evenly. We have two checks and two Xs for GSK. But there's still one vital piece missing. You might think nailing returns on capital and having good growth is the key, but we haven't touched on the one thing that I believe sets truly wonderful businesses apart, which is having these characteristics without using a lot of debt. Metric number five, we're looking at how the company uses debt. We want their net debt to be below the amount of free cash flow they produced in their last five years. With the business's spinoff, their net debt position has almost fallen in half over this time. They ended their most recent fiscal year with $14.8 billion in net debt, 
right now they have $17.2 billion in net debt. This is due to three recent acquisitions. In April 2022, the company announced it would acquire Sierra Oncology for $1.9 billion. In May of 2022, GSK announced they were acquiring Affinivax for up to $3.3 billion. And just recently, in April of 2023, GSK announced it would acquire Bellis Health for $2 billion. GSK has spent big on acquisitions in recent years. Even with this, the company has produced $45 billion of free cash flow in their last five fiscal years. That easily supports their net debt position. One thing to be mindful of is the company has decreased their free cash flows dating back to 2020. With their spinoff, they've only produced $4.6 billion of free cash flow in their last 12 months. However, even that would comfortably support their net debt position, meaning this is a check on metric number five. Before we get into the first of two different ways that we're going to value GSK, it's time for our bonus. As our bonus, we're looking at GSK's dividend profile. Right now, GSK pays a big 3.88% dividend yield. That's above the dividend yield from an S&P 500 ETF. People make mistakes all the time by blindly chasing dividends. For GSK, we want their dividends to be supported by their cash flows. That's been the case in all five of these years. The company's dividend has declined since 2020, in line with their declines in their free cash flows, but it's been supported through all of these years, even after the company's spinoff with their declines in their free cash flows in their last 12 months. GSK looks like it's still able to support their dividends. While this is a snapshot of their last five years of performance, and it's no guarantee for the future, GSK's dividend is covered by their free cash flows right now. The big metric of them all, metric number six, we want GSK's average five-year free cash flow to their total enterprise value to give us a yield that's above 5%. If this is the case, this gives a slight risk premium to the yield of the 10-year treasury. It's the first of two different ways we'll be using to come to an estimate of their fair value. Right now, GSK has an $88 billion enterprise value. This looks at both their market cap and their net debt position and gives a view of GSK similar to it being a private company. We learned in their last five years, GSK has produced $45 billion of free cash flow, meaning in an average year, they produce about $9 billion of free cash flow. When we divide their $9 billion of their average free cash flow by their $88 billion total enterprise value, we get about a 10.2% average free cash flow to enterprise value yield. On a current basis, the company produced $4.6 billion of free cash flow in their last 12 months. When that's divided by their $8.8 .8 billion enterprise value, we get about a 5.2% current free cash flow to enterprise value yield. Both of these yields are well above the yield of the 10-year treasury. They're also above that risk premium we'd be seeking, meaning this is a check on metric number six, but don't just rush out and go buy the business. We want to come to a more concrete estimate of a fair value per share for GSK. Everything we've discussed so far is important, but there's something missing that in my opinion is the main reason to analyze GSK, which takes us on to using a discounted cash flow model to come to an estimate of their fair value per share. A DCF model is based off the predictability of a company's free cash flows. Like any model in any discipline, its outputs are sensitive to its inputs. GSK has had a low degree of business predictability in their past. Partially, this is due to a lot of acquisitions and their recent spinoff. So this affects our assumptions here. Typically, we'd start with an average of their last three fiscal years worth of free cash flow. For GSK, we're going to be using their numbers since their recent spinoff. So we're averaging their last fiscal year of free cash flow and their free cash flows over their last 12 months. Then we're using historical assumptions to grow these into the future. It's up to you to figure out if these will be accurate for the future of the business or not. Assuming GSK grows their free cash flows at 4.2% for the next 10 years, then in the following decade, these cash flows grow at 3% annually. We won't be adding in the company's tangible book value as that's likely skewed based off some of the accounting for the business. If we're seeking a 15% rate of return, which is what Warren Buffett's looking for in addition to his margin of safety requirements, from today's valuations, it looks like an estimate of GSK's fair value per share is around $19. That's, That's down $16 from the company's current stock price. There are some key points to keep in mind. GSK's business has not been that predictable in its past due to some of their merger and acquisition activity. Also, this discount rate is an estimate of total returns to shareholders based off their free cash flows. It would already be including the company's dividend yield, so their stock price would not be appreciating by this full 15%. This rate of return would be dramatically outpacing how GSK has performed in its last 30 years or so, which is part of the reason this looks so low. Most importantly, this analysis is not 
not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. Consult with your financial advisor before making any investment decision. In just a minute, we'll give our final rating to GSK, but we have to address something first. We've covered the numbers, but the qualitative aspects of this business are just as important. What are they? Starting with the qualitative factor supporting a potential long thesis, number one, GSK's well-positioned Shingrix vaccine should support strong long-term growth based on excellent efficacy and limited competition. Number two, GSK faces relatively minor near-term patent losses, setting up steady growth over the next several years. Number three, GSK's next generation respiratory and HIV drugs look poised for strong growth over the next several years. We'd be remiss if we didn't cover the negative aspects of the business as well. The qualitative factors supporting a potential short thesis. Number one, the loss of the consumer business Halion increases the pressure on GSK's research and development to create the next generation of innovative treatments. Number two, GSK's late stage pipeline is not strong and the firm will need to develop its early stage pipeline pipeline to support growth over the next decade. Number three, HIV patent pressure to GSK's key drugs will likely begin in 2027, setting up a major hurdle for growth later in the decade. With the spinoff of Halion, GSK is now a pure play pharmaceutical business. Now that we have that balanced perspective, it's time for our rating. In analyzing GSK or GlaxoSmithKline, we learned the business earns above average returns on capital. Because of their Halion spinoff, GSK has declined in revenues and free cash flows. Their earnings are actually up, but the company also did dilute existing shareholders. Even with a more focused pharmaceutical business, the company can still easily support their net debt position with both their average and their current free cash flows. It's worth reiterating this analysis is not financial advice. Based off their free cash flow to enterprise value yields, GSK looks potentially attractive. However, when we performed our discounted cash flow analysis, from today's valuations, if you believe those historical assumptions and are looking for that 15% rate of return, an estimate of a fair value per share for GSK is around $19. That's well below any place the company has traded at in almost two and a half decades. It makes sense with their spinoff and with their history of past returns to shareholders. Looking at all the factors of our analysis, GSK looks like a moderate candidate for further research. It may be worth looking at their Halion spinoff as well. Remember, this is not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. Consult with a financial advisor before making any investment decision. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, share your thoughts about GSK and their recent activity and let me know what business you want me to look at next in the comments below. Thanks for learning about GSK with me and have a great day.